One, two, one, two, three, four. Hey everybody, it's Sam Jacobs. Welcome to the Sales Hacker Podcast. Today on the show, we've got Brendan Cam. And Brendan is the founder of a business called Co-Founder and the CEO of a business called Thanks. And it's a, it's a gifting platform that's really interesting and it helps facilitate great connections and great relationships between salespeople. And we talk all about it. He's a, he's a digital industry veteran and executive. And so uh, it's a really interesting conversation both about his current company, but also about his background because he's worked in some really, really interesting kind of asset bartering business that I was personally fascinated with. So really love this conversation. Before we get there, we want to thank our sponsors. We've got two sponsors on the show. Businesses run on, on documents. Conga is changing the way the world works by modernizing, streamlining, and automating your documents, contracts, and processes to make it easier to do business. See why Conga is the number one paid app on the Salesforce App Exchange with a free trial or demo today. Second sponsor, the company you know and love, Outreach, the number one sales engagement platform. Outreach revolutionizes customer engagement by moving away from solid conversations to a streamlined and customer-centric journey, leveraging the next generation of artificial intelligence, the platform allows sales reps to deliver consistent, relevant, and responsible communication for each prospect every time, enabling personalization at scale that was previously unthinkable. Check them out at www.outreach.io. Finally, today is Tuesday, July 21st, if I'm not mistaken. And I hope that uh, if you're listening to this, you hop over to Revenue Collective. We're hosting our July offsite today. And it's featuring a number of great companies, including High Spot, Fanta, and Freshworks, some great speakers, and all sort of centered and powered by our West Coast community because we've got communities in San Francisco, Los Angeles, Vancouver, Portland, Oregon at this point, really all over. So uh, we hope that you do that. Uh, information on LinkedIn, go to revenuecollective.com as well. But the links and the logins are all available on our, on our LinkedIn page, and uh, it's open to the public. So we hope you can join us. Now, without further ado, let's listen to my conversation with Brendan Cam. Hey, everybody, it's Sam Jacobs. Welcome to the Sales Hacker Podcast. Today on the show, I'm super excited to have Brendan Cam. Brendan's the co-founder and CEO of a company called Thanks. And it's a really interesting company that we're going to talk all about. Now, before starting Thanks, Brendan was a technology and media veteran. He's has he spent more than 17 years focused on sales, product, and client development. He, during his time as a sales executive at Orion Trading and My Media, Brendan noticed a shift taking place in the way service providers courted prospects and maintained relationships, with more time being dedicated to sales development and less time being spent with clients one-on-one. -on -one. He saw a need for a digital bridge that can be used to initiate and foster interpersonal relationship, and of course, that is where thanks comes in. Brendan, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Sam. I'm really excited to be here. We're excited to have you, and uh, and 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 delighted to hear more about about thanks. So, for the folks out there listening, the company is spelled T H N K S. No A. We start with the, the baseball card, which is giving you an opportunity to tell a little bit about the company. Give us the snapshot. Give us the impetus and the inspiration for for why you started it, and then we'll go from there. Sure. Thank you. Um, so, thanks is really a way to send small gestures of appreciation digitally. Uh, that strengthen your business relationship. So the idea really came from, you know, if you walked into Starbucks right now and saw your client there, you'd buy them their coffee or their breakfast, you know, whatever they're getting sort of every time, right? It's not really a gift. It's just this little gesture. And so the thought was, why not do that, you know, for clients that are, are if I'm in New York, my clients in Chicago, LA, you know, I should be able to do the same thing. And so it kind of grew from that idea. It's the, the Uber ride when it's raining out just to say, hey, you know, skip the subway, your ride's on me the bowl of chicken soup when uh, someone has to skip a meeting because they're not feeling well. Um, those little things that are, you know, they mean a little more than kind of the swag that we've all done through the years. And they're not quite a gift, right? It's not really meant for any reason other than, you know, hey, we've got a relationship here and I'm thinking about you. So uh, that was the sort of initial impetus. And actually my co-founder, a gentleman named Larry Rubin, former M&A attorney, and, you know, he originally sort of brought up the idea of, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we could send these things digitally and, and just do this over our phones and the attorney and him kind of kicked in and said, but wait a minute, there's all these compliance rules and things we have to worry about on the back end, like a, what budget does it come from? How do I expense it? These are the things that sort of prevent people in, in sales and customer success from, from doing these things, right? The, I know for me, it used to be that wallet that was full of 100 receipts at the end of the month, and you just, you just ended up not even doing your expense report because you're like, I'll just eat it. It's not worth it. And so, so thanks really takes care of that stuff as well. It's about you know, that administrative tasks being off your plate so you can really focus on building a relationship. And that's really what we try to do. Awesome. How old is the company? 
We founded the company uh, February of 2016, but that was really you know two guys in a PowerPoint deck and and uh, you know going around trying to find some investors. So uh, we did fortunately and spent much of 2017 sort of building out the product and the MVP. Uh, and so 2018 was our first full, full year in business. So a couple of years into it now, uh, in terms of our you know where we are in the actual business. That's awesome. And and so is it when you say digitally, do you mean like sending Starbucks gift cards as opposed to is it is it not the physical distrib you know, is it not sending actual stuff but only sending digital things? So it's a little bit of both. You know, we wanted a way that I could buy you not just a gift card, but a, a sort of specific item, right? And, and that was kind of the key, especially for compliance reasons as well. Uh, if you work in a regulated industry, I, I, you know, I can't just send you $10 to Starbucks. And also, that's just a little impersonal. So the thought was, how can we send these very sort of personalized gestures? And so there's multiple ways you can actually do it. And thanks. If it's something like a Starbucks or uh, a Grubhub, you can get a, a code or in, in Starbucks case, a barcode that you can scan right at the store. We figured as a recipient, you know, for a cup of coffee, you don't want to mess with delivery and waiting around for something. On the flip side, you could send someone a bottle of scotch or wine, you know, maybe a, some sort of gift basket. Those items are going to actually come physically. But the process from a sender standpoint is still always that you're going to email, text, Twitter, do it in some digital fashion. When that hit recipient hits accept, they'll either immediately get their barcode or code, or in the case of a physical item, they'll just say, you know, where do you want to have this sent? And that way you don't need to know a home address. I'll give you an example. We had someone send someone a kayak, probably my favorite thing, thing that's been sent. And I was talking to the client. I said, oh, that's really cool. And they, they made a good point, which was, you know, there was no other way we could have done this. you you're not going to send someone a kayak to their office on Fifth Avenue in New York and make them walk down the, the right to, to the subway with it. But it's a business context, so they also weren't going to uh, have a home address to be able to send it to. So sent it via email through Thanks. And the recipient was able to get it, have it you know put in place to their home, and it was you know a top refer for a year for a big Fortune 500 company. So it was a a big item as opposed to our typical kind of coffees and breakfasts that we do. That's fantastic. So is the business model like a, a license, like a SaaS platform plus kind of transaction costs where you take a little bit of a percentage off of whatever the item is? So we actually, we do the transaction based. We don't charge any, uh, any SaaS fees, subscription fees currently. It's sort of an important thing to us that this thing work well enough that we don't need to lock you in, right? That's the idea. Uh, you're going to use it. You're going to love it. You're going to see an ROI. So just come use it. And you're not going to have to sign a contract, just frictionless, right? Sign up, upload your logo so it can show up on your item and start using it. So that's typically how we operate. And, and you know, if you're a large client spending a good amount of money, you'll have an account manager and some of the typical SaaS features you might see, but we're not going to kind of lock you into that. We just want you to start using it. Cool. Yeah. And if uh, so I'm asking these questions because I'm considering becoming a client, hey, uh, <laughs> if I want to send somebody a bottle of like liquor or something, is it like I log in and there's a menu, like you have a trusted provider saying like, here's the scotches you can choose from, or do I find the scotch? And then how does that work? Yep. Uh, you you kind of nailed it with that first part. There's a bunch of curated categories that we will kind of take the best of the best and what we've learned people like to send. There's also a search that we built this custom API with Amazon. So you can actually send any item from Amazon as well. So it gives you almost a limitless sort of supply of things. But we have people all the time who want to find that that specific bottle of wine or that particular scotch that's maybe a little more rare. And so they, there's a little chat function where you can request something as well. But we find the curated categories work well because we can customize them. So if you're working in real estate, it can be a category called open house or first showing, right? Whereas if you work in, you know, if you're a sales guy at Salesforce, you're going to want to see categories that are reflective of like your own sales cycle. So we'll often customize things that way as well. And is it, is the, is the buyer typically like the VP of sales or the sales enablement, or I guess maybe sales operations, whoever is responsible for enabling the sales team with like tools and, you know, putting arrows in their quiver that can help them close deals. Is that who typically the customer is that you're trying to sell to? Yeah, that's my sort of ideal customer. Uh, oftentimes it starts with an individual contributor. They'll kind of find thanks. The majority of my business, frankly, has come from people who've received a thanks. You know, they'll get oh, that's cool. you know, clients and then they come in and say, hey, how do I do this for my business? So I often start with, you know, a couple people on a team and then it sort of grows organically. The nice thing about us sales guys is we're so competitive. If someone next to me has a tool that I don't have, I'm going to find out how I get that. Right. Uh, and that's a big yeah. grow, to be honest. And that's nice that there's no subscription required. So, you know, ultimately the salesperson, maybe they can expense it, but if they can't, 
maybe it's worth it to him just spend 10 bucks and send somebody a cup of coffee. Exactly. Exactly. And then, you know, when we get a sort of mass of people at a certain uh, company, we'll go in and, and try to locate that VP or sales enablement person and say, hey, you've got a bunch of users. Look at all these cool features I can give you if you sign up the rest of your team. Awesome. Well, I've got more questions, but we could, well, let's, let's first, let's, let's place you in time and in the history of mankind. Tell us how, how did you get here? Tell us a little bit about your origin story. I, I read, you know, your bio, you worked at Orion trading, which is frankly a company I'm not familiar with. Mm -hmm. And then a company called me media walk us through the journey. Also be curious, you know, where you're from, where'd you grow up? Just give us a little bit of background. Sure. I am a uh, New Jerseyan by birth. Uh, I've spent most of my life in sort of the Northeast, uh, you know, working and living in, in New York or New Jersey. In uh, the early 2000s, I graduated from Johns Hopkins University down in Baltimore. Um, Heard of it? Yeah, I studied uh, media, which is rare when you think Johns Hopkins, I think you think doctor, which frankly, when my parents were paying the bill, I'm sure they thought doctor as well, but here we are. Um, so I, I had come out of there and uh, I was a media planner at in within Interpublic Group at a company called Initiative, and a couple of years into that, I ended up getting introduced to Orion Trading, which was their their barter arm. And so, media barter is effectively trading distressed assets for advertising time. It's a niche thing, so I'm not surprised you hadn't heard of that one. And you know, if I'm being honest about how I got there, it was uh, you know I'm three or four years out of college at that point. I get offered this role at this kind of thing that I didn't understand, which was Orion. And I just started dating a girl and the role was going to give me a VP title pretty early in my career. And I, I like, I don't tell this story often. It's a little embarrassing, but I was basically like, well, this is going to impress this girl. I just started dating. So I'm going to take this job. I don't even know what it is. <laughs> and, uh, and thankfully that girl's my wife now and I have three children. And, uh, <laughs> I was going to ask, yeah, uh, it would be a really bad story if yeah, you broke up with no her way. like a month later. <laughs> um, so I take this job and I, I honestly, I, I wasn't even sure about it. I was, I think employee 19 at this company. Uh, so this is about 2006 and within a year, the economy tanks and, uh, suddenly everyone's got distressed assets and nobody has advertising time. And we're suddenly a, a kind of a hot business. And over the next six years, I go from sort of an early employee at this company housed under this big, you know, conglomerate media firm to a company with 300 people and seven international offices and really a contributor to that big media conglomerate at that point. And I had grown to be kind of the head of sales and customer success. And I just, at that point, I was kind of looking at it. And now, you know, like I mentioned, I'm, I'm married to this girl and we're having our first kid and I'm, I'm looking at my career and saying, I really liked that, right? I, I like that, that growth and that you know, there was all these problems to solve and I kind of wanted to experience that again. And so that's what really led me to the world of startups and eventually to my media. And I guess long story short, I ended up, I was running a team of about 40 sales and, and client service people at my last job, met who the person who's now my co-founder, Larry, who, who I mentioned was a former M&A attorney. He had also built and sold a company called Cross Media Works had what he calls his happy day and was sort of at that stage of his career where he was more ready to be an investor and mentor and guide. And so he had, you know, uh, as we talked about this idea, it just seemed more and more like, hey, this is something that we could really tackle. And so when he finally came to me one day and said, look, I, I'm willing to put in the initial capital uh, if you kind of help run the show with, with another person that we had on board. And, and that's where it all happened. And that's how we started there. That's, uh, I love that story. I, um, I'm going to make you define something because I'm, I'm sure that the audience is wondering. So when you talk about distressed assets for advertising inventory, give us a specific example so people can kind of imagine it the right way. Sure. My, uh, my biggest deal, actually. So I was working with American Airlines. They had eight MD-80 aircraft that were coming end of life. And so typically what would happen is say that that aircraft cost, I don't know, maybe they cost $10 million when they had ordered them 20 years before. And then that's, that's an asset that's on their books that has lost value, right? And so at the end of that value, they're going to scrap that for, I don't know, maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars of scrap metal and pieces, right? So what I would do is come in and say, hey, why don't I give you $10 million, that original price? So you don't have a loss anymore in your books. I'm actually going to replace that, that asset with this credit that you can use towards your advertising time. And the way that'll work is you'll give me those airplanes and I'll scrap them and I'll figure out how to make you know, a few pennies on the dollar from that. But ultimately what I'm really going to do is take your, your committed media spend that you now have with me. And I'm going to go back to the media players, ABC and NBC and, and strike a deal. And so I would go to like, say ABC news and say, Hey, what do you need to buy? 
uh, maybe it's news vans, right? And that's going to cost you a million dollars. Let me buy your news vans for you. No cash out of pocket for you, but I want you to give me back $3 million worth of airtime in exchange. So you basically pay for your, your news vans with air. And so if you see what I'm doing there, I'm kind of arbitraging where I now own that media at sort of a leveraged three to one rate. And on the flip side, I've got this $10 million credit that my client's going to use, but they're going to use it like a coupon on their media. So they can't use it all at once. They're going to spend maybe you know 20% of it at a time. So I still maintain my, my leverage. I make my money in between those deals, plus my, my scrap metal airplane. Fascinating, fascinating business. It is. That is, we should, did, has there, are, are there books on this? Because <laughs> this, this, how do you, I have so many questions, but we need oh, to sure. keep going. How, I mean, what do you do when you get rid of the, how do you get rid of the airplanes? And then you just start hitting the phone saying, Hey, anybody need an airplane? Yep. You, you end up with a network of scrap metal guys. Uh, airplanes are fascinating. There's a big sort of uh, sub scene in Texas where people will uh, buy like first class seats as collector's items. I, I don't know if they put them in their garage or what, but uh, you find these kind of ways to extract pennies on the dollar from things because that adds up over time. I mean, I can tell you from some of the deals I've done, I still in my house to this day, I think I have a couch that was in a barter deal. So we, you know, we'd get these, these deals on items and then offer them up to our employees and you could buy a cheap couch or a TV or whatever. So it's crazy. It's one of those businesses you wouldn't hear much about because who wants to talk about their distressed assets, right? So you're not going to do much PR around it or, or, you know, things that would make it sort of out in the open, it, but it's a, uh, you know, it's a piece of everyone's business. And so, and, and the, the, the bottom line point is that for the the $10 million credit, they get $3 million of NBC ad inventory and you paid a million dollars for it. Exactly. So you've got this kind of ARB in there. It's a little bit of a simplified explanation, I guess, of the full model, but that's effectively how it, how it ends up working. It's great. That's movie. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Again, there, there's a book or a podcast series on this business because that must, you must have, there must be some adventures with some of these weird assets that you claim that, you know, you got to find a home for oh, to yeah. the point of a couch in your garage. Yeah. I mean, we could talk about it for hours. Trust me. Uh, <laughs> well, I'll tell you this for purposes of this podcast, there's nothing better as I look back in my career that made me scrappy and try to be, you know, really figure out creative solutions than, than being in that business. It was just, it was, you had to do it, right? And, and you were heavily commissioned to do so. So I think the people running that business, uh, a gentleman named Brian McMahon was my CEO and he's one of my favorite people of all time. I learned so much from him and, uh, you know, he would empower you even as a young person to, to go find a solution. And I think that's, that's awesome. Super important. Yeah. Super important. So let's, um, I want to talk about not just, I have a couple of questions about, uh, about, about starting thanks. The first is that doesn't sound like you're technical and certainly Larry does not sound super technical. Where's the software development coming from? Is that another co-founder uh, that we don't know about or is it um, a team that you hired somewhere? Where's the, where's the code coming from? So I think one thing you'll find as you, you talk to me uh, is that everything in my life, I found the power of the, the network and the relationships, which of course is exactly what Thanks is about. And it's the case here. So the gentleman that I actually worked for and under for a while at my media is an amazing CTO. And he was someone I called as we started this to say, look, I've got this MVP that I just kind of outsourced to get something to be able to show investors and, and sort of prove it out. But I know it's not something that's going to scale. And I, you know, I know enough self-taught sort of code to be able to read it and say, well, yeah, this is going to break, but at least it works for now. And so he was a person who I went to uh, for advice. And then that advice turned into, uh, let me take a look and let me take a look into can I invest? And then from can I invest to I'll give you 10 hours to, you know what, I got to get involved with this. I really like it. Um, so it, it's sort awesome. of organically. And, and uh, his name is Michael Yoon. He's, he's uh, uh, I guess, not technically a, a founder, but like came in very early. Like I said, he's an investor as well. And he's just a tremendous human being and, and sort of guide and mentor as well. But he runs the whole shop technically for us but isn't sort of just technical. He's also a, I mean, like I said, he's an investor and a, a involved in other businesses as well. And he's really someone I view as like a, a friend and mentor too. Um, so there's no better kind of person you could have overseeing your tech than that, I think. Yeah, that's fantastic. So let me ask you a question. How, what's, you know, this is the, is this the first company you've started? It is, it is. So I've, uh, I've always run kind of sales and client services, but this is the first time, uh, you know, the buck stops with me completely. So what's been the biggest surprise, you know, or the biggest set of surprises? What's something that even though maybe you read it in a book or talked to somebody about it, that you still didn't fully grasp the magnitude of or, or the seriousness of, if there's anything at all, maybe there's nothing. 
it's almost like I want to say everything. <laughs> um, it's just, you know, part of the reason I ended up here, I think, is that I had that like look in the mirror moment when it was like, hey, am I really going to go do this? And, and you realize uh, I'm the type of person that would sit there and I'm not a complainer, but I would find myself saying, I don't understand why we're doing it this way, or I would do it better, and I would do it that way, right? And at some point, you have to look at yourself and go, well, if that's true, you got to go do it. Right. You can't just sit here and say, you know, uh, I think I know better. And so that was a tough moment to have that honest conversation with yourself, right? To be able to say, do I really know better? Cause, cause I don't, I know I don't, cause I don't have this experience. So I actually tried to go into it with an open mind of, I don't know everything. I don't have all the answers and I need people like, like Larry Rubin, like Michael Yoon, Michael Loeb, who's one of my, uh, actually it's my biggest investor. These people who've been there and done it those are the people I like to lean on, you know? And so I, I think I'm big on, on, I know how to focus my time and, and build a team, but I knew like everything was going to be harder than I thought. And, and we went through the, almost the classic stories you hear, right? There was a time where I couldn't take a salary at all. And that was our conversation with the wife, right? Like, Hey, we've got these kids and, and all this stuff. And I, I've not only quit my job to take half the salary. Now I'm, now I'm taking no salary for a while. So, you know, all these things kind of lead you to say, wow, this is just, on paper, it sounds okay and be like, I can scrap by with no salary. And then you get in real life and you panic. Uh, and I had those moments. So it's almost like, I know it's a cop out answer, but literally everything is uh, a little bit harder in the short term while you're doing it. And then you look back and go, man, we've accomplished so much. Maybe that wasn't so hard. It's, uh, so it gives you this false sense of like, I could do this again. Um, because you always think it's easier as you look backwards in the, in the rear view mirror. <laughs> well, I, um, I, know, I know what you're talking about. But when we think about, to your point, that it's not a cop out. I'm not going to be mean to you. But when we think about like functional areas that you didn't have a full appreciation for, are there some mm-hmm. that just emerge to you? Uh, you know, whether it's like finance and you know making sure that you're checking the checking account of the business checking account every day, and you know you got access to financing sources, or or are there are there are there? I'm just always curious. Like, or are, are is it pr- running a product and engineering team? What what is the What's the discipline that that sort of caught you by surprise, if anything? Yeah, I, I think funnily enough, it might be accounting. You know, obviously related to that that finance piece, but you're looking at decisions. You know, you think of accounting and you think of the kind of classes you took in school, and great, this goes on this side of the ledger and that on the other side. But there's a lot of decisions to make that could affect you way down the road. I mean, starting with just we incorporated as a C corp, right? And that changes everything versus if we had started as an LLC, and it just goes from there in terms of. What's your policy around, you know, uh, amortizing or you know how you handle your R and D and all these things that you have to make a decision when you're three people early on, and not that you can't change it, but it could be painful. And then how that affects you five, six years down the road if you're looking at different investors or, or being acquired at some point. So that one certainly sort of took me by surprise how much I've had to think about and focus on what the implications of all those things might be. And I think the other one is um, customer support. So it's very easy to say, well, you know, everyone hates customer support and sitting on queues and all these things. So we're going to have great customer support. You know, I think of companies like uh, Bonobos or or Zappos, you know, where you you hear about these great customer support experiences, but actually spinning that up and and putting the dollars against it and training a team. um, It's just not that simple because there's, there's a lot to it uh, and making people feel, you know, comfortable, especially with a product or brand they don't know. So that would be the second one that really comes to mind as, oh, that's, uh, that's a little more than I thought it would be. Awesome. It's a good answer. So something that, you know, you, uh, you've commented on and, and, uh, and, and wanted to chat about, which I think is just really interesting. One of the thing, the pieces of advice that you sometimes share is you say, don't follow your passion. Walk us through what you mean by that. Yeah. I, uh, I feel like there's just, it's one of those kind of sometimes trite pieces of advice of, um, hey, you want to start your own company, make sure it's, you follow your passion. And that's great if you can. I think, I think the biggest wins come from people who follow their passion. And those are the stories you hear, right? Because those are the successes. So they naturally, those are the ones that are out there. And you go, look how big this is. This was someone who followed their passion. What I find as I talk to a lot of people is sometimes the passion can be not a good thing to follow. It gives you an out in some ways, right? It's like, you get going and you hit that difficult point and it's like, well, maybe this wasn't my passion. That's why it's not working out. Um, you know, like it's versus like, Oh, well, let's be honest here. If this isn't working out, it's cause I've done something wrong. Right. Or I haven't, or the idea wasn't as good as I thought it was or whatever it might be. So in some ways it helps you if you're not sort of following that passion necessarily, you know, I, I think it's also, you can be really good at something and that can allocate 
if you allocate your time to that and have success in it, it can open up the time for your passion, right? So I think of like an example of a, a sales guy that I know who's like, a guy could probably sell anything, right? And instead of going and selling like something that he was really passionate about, he went and found a market that was niche and that he um, could just sell and it kind of auto renewed itself. And it was like a, a little area that, you know, he could just easily make a lot of money on because he was a good sales guy in that sort of upfront process. And that opened up a lot of time for him and, and made his life like really, really easy in some ways. And it wasn't because he followed that passion. So I understand why people say that and you want your work to be your something you love. But if your work can be something you're successful at, it can open up a lot more time for you. And I don't know, when I think about being rich, I think about time, right? I don't, money maybe because it buys you time, but like, I don't consider someone rich who makes a shit ton of money, but has to show up at work wearing something that someone else told them to work at these specific hours and go to that specific meeting. Like that to me is, you know, you're still working for someone else. You haven't really, you haven't really made it and become rich. So when I think about (laughs) becoming rich, I think about like being able to say no and having my own time. So I don't know. That's just sort of how I view it, but I tend to be a little contrarian and stuff in these things as well. I like how you view it. Um, by your definition, I'm very rich. So <laughs> <I love it. laughs> that's, that's fantastic. Um, you, you've uh, confirmed all of my life choices, at least. <laughs> um, the other thing I found is that people uh, misdefine their passion because they're, they put these big words like, I don't like marketing. It's like, mm-hmm. well, marketing is a bunch of discrete activities. Let's figure out which of those you derive, you know, enjoyment from and which don't, because maybe, maybe you're just framing it in a weird way based on, you know, how society tells you to think about it. The other thing you've said is you just think that this concept, you know, cause there is this constant debate, uh, and you know, I don't know, how do you say his name? Rabois, Rabois, right. but Keith, uh, you know, Keith Rabois, whatever, Rabois, just a bit of a jerk on uh, on Twitter, but a very successful jerk, is always talking, and not just him, but many, many, and it's all, it tends to be, frankly, investors who are, um, you know, creating like this cult of uh, a celebrity and personality around the founders that have made them wealthy. And they talk about how, um, You know, like, I don't know if you have to work weekends, but everybody that's successful, I know works weekends. Right. And so, and and this concept of struggle porn, as you, as you've commented on in the past, which is really like this, um, you know, the, 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 well, to your point, right? Like the, the perverse, the thrill and the fetishization of people that are just like throwing everything uh, to the wind and just, you know, pursuing something, you know, every, every other consequence and every other relationship be damned and working 12 hours a day and, you know, eating ramen and all this stuff. And you said, you don't really agree with that. Walk, walk us through your perspective on that. Cause I don't agree with that either, but curious on how you think about it. Yeah. I, I hate this idea that like struggling is good. Struggling is something that's going to happen. You're going to have to do it. you will go through it, but that, that shouldn't be like the end game. And it feels like it is sometimes it's a way to, uh, you know, people call them like entrepreneurs, right? So I'm not really building anything. I'm just kind of struggling and not gaining traction, but I'm just going to keep doing that because I've joined this little cult of, uh, you know, I'm working my ass off, you know, 23 hours a day and, and nothing's really coming out of it. And even if something is coming out of it, that's not sustainable. It's not, I, I guess it goes back to almost my definition of what's, you know, what success is and what being rich is like, you haven't really solved anything if, if you're just doing that, right? It means you're not working on the right things or you haven't brought in the right people to, to kind of help. It just leads you down a, this lane of like redefining your success around how much you work versus the output of it, right? So success to me, the most successful person to me would be someone who uh, you know has a clear calendar, works on the, the right things that they want to work on and is getting that, that output that they're looking for. I don't see the value in that kind of like, well, I'm just, you know, sleeping two hours a night. Uh, I think the ultimate sort of expression of that is probably, you know, Tim Ferriss's four hour work week. Maybe that goes a little too far of outsourcing your entire life. But, but I think his point was simply that, right? Like there's ways to, there's different ways to define success. And to me, it's, it's never going to be, well, uh, I've just worked more. I think you can work smarter and, and still work really hard, but ultimately your success is going to be who you surround yourself with and what you work on, not, not how long you work on it. I, uh, uh, plus plus 100 to that. I worked at this company. I'm always subtweeting people in these podcasts, but they don't listen. So it doesn't really matter. But I worked at this company where, you know, people would be like, I'm working till midnight on this uh, proposal. I'm like, okay, is the proposal due tomorrow? They're like, no. <laughs> I'm like, okay, <laughs> what's going on here? And uh, I found that the difference is that there are some cultures, not Western culture typically, but some Eastern European cultures where I just, it's, I can't speak for the whole culture, but there's a, 
it's not a joy culture. It's mm-hmm. not, um, the people aren't celebrating happiness. They are celebrating the, uh, you know, the success that comes from perseverance and from uh, suffering through misery and uh, just sort of like a pain culture where anyway, yeah. Yeah. Random, but um, no, that's I, been my experience. Anyone's ever worked with a place where you know no one leaves until the boss leaves? Like it's like the first thing I tell new people at Thanks. I'm like, please don't watch what I do. I, I don't care if you're getting your work done. Like, go work in Tahiti if you need to. Like, it's all good, man. Like, you don't have to be here just to show your face. That's just silly, uh, and I think that's all related as well. Yeah, yeah, it is, and it's it's not even possible in COVID. So right. uh, I think. Um, <laughs> we've just going to have to use to like set clear goals, set clear guidelines, and then let people do what they need to do. Brendan, it's been awesome having you on the show. And uh, the last thing we do before we go is we like to kind of pay it forward and talk about, you know, I call it, uh, I mean, it's not just content because it's people too, but it's influences. Uh, It's books, great books that you think we should read, great people you think we should know about, you know, great ideas that you think are really foundational to who you are as a person. So if you're thinking about that broadly defined category of, you know, the breadcrumb trail of following the breadcrumb trail to figure out how you became who you are, who are people or ideas or books that you think we should know about? Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I guess the biggest overarching thing I'll say here is as much as I do read them or nowadays, oftentimes listen to an audio book of sort of the very specific things around building a, a business or entrepreneurship, I find the things that help me most are probably things that I, I read or ingested during like formative years. So as like a teenager, one book that comes to mind is uh, The Demon Haunted World. It's by Carl Sagan, actually, the uh, astronomer and uh, former TV host, actually. But it's about sort of a little bit about having skepticism and, and viewing things scientifically and breaking them down into sort of small in, individual pieces. I find that these things that are sort of ancillary to what I want to do tend to just kind of stick in my brain, right? And then they they just kind of infiltrate what I'm doing on a day to day. And that's a book that I find I'll almost forget about it, and then I'll come across it again because I've always kept it around. I'll see it on a bookshelf and I'll flip through, and I'm like, oh yeah, that's like how I'm running my sales team now. You know, I, this thing like stuck with me 20 years later. If I think about different sort of people and things, I actually had a, a coach, a high school basketball coach, you know, Joe D'Alessandro in Somerville, New Jersey, and he would just say constantly, don't complain, don't explain. And at the time I would roll my eyes because I was a high school kid. Um, but man, do I, I try to live by that now, right? Like, you don't, I don't need to explain why I did this wrong or, or what happened. Let's just fix it and go forward, right? So I'm not going to complain about it. I'm just going to do better. I'm not going to explain to you, you know, you don't need a long list of why I screwed that up. It's just, yep, that went wrong. And here's how we're going to fix it. Um, I think that's just always like a great, a great little motto to kind of keep in mind. And then if I think about some of my favorite sort of uh, people I've come across or worked with, I mentioned Brian McMahon at Orion Trading, just what an amazing business and so much that I learned from him. I think about my favorite founder, uh, Jeff Rader. Jeff founded uh, Warby Parker and now Harry's. So maybe one of the only people in the world who's ever done two sort of billion dollar startups. Jeff's actually a good friend of mine. It was a roommate of mine. And he just always talk about someone who knows how to embrace life, but also, you know, build these amazing companies. There's no point where I, I could say, Jeff, do you want to grab a drink or we should throw this party or whatever? He's always down, right? He's the opposite of the struggle porn guy. I don't understand how he does it, but it's amazing. <laughs> Watch someone so successful still be able to like, you know, he spends all the time with his kids. He's a great father. He's a great husband. Like, dude's just awesome. Uh, and I love having friends like that. And, and so he's someone I really admire, even though he's, a, I guess, a peer. Awesome. Well, that's a great list. Brendan, if folks are listening and they want to, you know, there's a million reasons why. Maybe they want to just chat with you. Maybe they want to become customers of Thanks. What's the best way for people to reach out to you? How do you prefer to be outreached to? Oh, I am like a, a fully connected human being these days. So my email is uh, uh, bcam, B-K-A-M-M, at thanks.com, T-H-N-K-S. But I check my Twitter, LinkedIn, uh not so much Facebook these days, but I'll check it occasionally. But you know, however people are kind of comfortable reaching out, I you know I usually throw my my phone numbers out there. People text me, call. Uh, I love to connect. You know, like I said, it's about that network. So anyone listening who wants to connect, please do reach out. Awesome, Brendan. Thanks so much for being on the show, and uh, we'll talk to you on Friday for Friday Fundamentals. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sam.
Hey everybody, it's Sam Jacobs. This is Sam's Corner. Loved that conversation with Brendan Cam. Just first of all, really enjoyed hearing about his background in the media business. I thought that was really, really interesting. And you know, I think that there's a couple a couple key things to take away, but I think the first and the foremost is just the the practice and a lot of people talk about it. It's really hard sometimes. Me personally, I'm a moody guy and I'm not always feeling super positive, but this concept of gratitude and practicing gratitude. I think that's a really important thing to think about that you have to, you're going to get back what you put out into the world. And if you put out negativity and kind of contractedness and smallness, that's what's going to come back to you and the world is going to close in around you. But if you practice gratitude and you, and you look for opportunities to do, as they say, random acts of kindness, I think that you're going to find that the returns were down to you in ways that you hadn't even anticipated. And so the fact that Brendan built a whole business around this, I think is really, really interesting. And, you know, he talked about how making little investments in your relationships has a powerful effect over time. We talked about the same concept when Andrew Sykes was on the show. We talked about this notion of compounding interest, right? 1% every day, 1% of gratitude every day, finding people to thank and to give something to without asking anything in return every single day. That can help you. That can pull you out of a bad mind. Mindset. So I really enjoyed that conversation with Brendan, and uh, and I think Thanks is a really interesting platform. I hope you check them out. Now, uh, before we go, we want to thank our sponsors, of course, Conga, changing the way the world works by modernizing, streamlining, and automating your documents, contracts, and processes to make it easier to do business. Check them out at conga.com. And of course, we want to thank Outreach, which is revolutionizing the way customers engage with sales professionals by moving away from siloed conversations to a streamlined and customer-centric journey. Check them out at www.outreach.io. I'll talk to you next time. Thanks for listening.